Excited program created by Rio Grande. Phoenix Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 182, regarding a burglary of the Turf Cigar Store, 213 North Central Avenue. The burglary occurred this date. The suspect may be armed. That's all. Rolls and Burgers. Grande's success as the fastest growing oil company in the West has been largely due to one minute of time each week. This minute, spent with you through calling all cars. We thank you for the privilege of being an invited guest in your home, and we return this hospitality by inviting you to call at any one of the thousands of independent Rio Grande stations. Our invitation to you is sincere, logical, and true. First, cracked gasoline is the most modern scientific method of refining gasoline. Remember that. For on this fact, oil men universally agree. Rio Grande Crack is the only gasoline in the West that can be refined by the internationally famous Sinclair refining process, the model process of the oil industry. Second, as proof that Rio Grande Crack gasoline is a definitely superior patented product, we point to the testimony and endorsement of the drivers and buyers of gasoline for police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. For them, the finest gasoline is an absolute necessity. They drove over 55 million miles last year on Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Remember this, more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment are powered by Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. And third, we call this police car performance. For that's exactly what it is. And that's exactly what you'll get if you will accept our invitation to try Rio Grande Crack gasoline tomorrow at your independent Rio Grande dealer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have the following message from Sheriff Roy Merrill of Maricopa County, Arizona. In my years as a peace officer, I have come into contact with many youthful criminals. Always the impulse of the average citizen towards this type of criminal is to give him another chance. It is just this other chance that has sent so many men farther along the path of crime. In the case you are to hear tonight, every person connected with the crime had served one or more terms in prison or had been at one time or another an inmate of a state institution for the collection of criminal tendencies. Of the men convicted and sentenced for the crime... Not one of them thought for a minute of the possibility that his particular crime might not pay. This case is a tribute to the splendid spirit of cooperation that exists between the law enforcing agencies of the various states and communities. I wish to express my thanks to the police departments of San Francisco and Los Angeles, and especially to Deputies J.J. Clarkson and Ray Bogey, Lieutenants Chilson and Barber of Los Angeles, whose untiring work made the rapid solution of this case possible. On a wet, dreary day in February of this year, in a cheap rooming house in the center of Los Angeles wholesale district, four men huddled around a small gas heater discussing their plans, which they hope will gain for them the large bankroll that every crook covets. Oh, rain, rain. Don't it ever do nothing in this such I town but rain? Ah, oh, shut up. Don't you ever get tired of driving about the weather? Listen, Mug, don't get smart with me. I'll bring your ears back, see? Tough guy, huh? Yeah. You'll be tough if you string along with us, wise guy. Listen, Mug, I got a record that'll make you look like a Sunday school teacher. Just a hardened criminal, ain't you? Yeah, quiet down. You two sound like a couple of kids on a sandlot baseball game. Lay off this arguing. Let's get this Phoenix job set. Where's that? Went out to get a bottle of wine. Ah, you don't need it. That guy ain't got nerve enough. Yeah, shut up. Now, look, Harry. We take your Ford down to Adams of Figaro and turn it in on that Lincoln they got down there. What's wrong with taking the Ford to Phoenix? Yeah, how many times I got to tell you, Sheriff Merrill's got a list of every car that's owned by a guy with a record? Yeah, of course, if you don't think that you've got a record. David. Okay. Now, listen, Louis. You go down on Main Street and get that torch, see? 
Then drive over to East Station and pick up the gear. What's the matter with getting them at the same place? Well, the less you buy it in one place, the less chance we run of getting identified. You better let me get that torch. I know what kind I want. Well, all right. Maybe that's best. Good now. Hey, who's that mug with him? That's uh, Shorty Dolan. Some stumble my mark's been running around with. Well, pull over. Hey, you Come on, let's go. Ah, wait a minute. Okay, let's hit it. Hey, who's that bird you was talking to when we drove up? A friend of mine. Oh, was he? Hey, who are you getting hard with anyway? I said he's a friend of mine. You want to make something out of it? Maybe I do. I yeah. told you he's a bird we met in a beer joint down in Pico. Just a mug who's out of work, down on his luck. He's all right. Yeah, I'm telling you, someday you're going to pick up a dick that way, and we'll all be in stir. Nah, don't worry about it. Later that night, in a cafe on the principal street of Phoenix, Henry Becker, Harry and Art Tobe, and Louis Babajan contact their finger man in Phoenix, one K.O. Kelly, a man whose long prison record equaled if it did not exceed that of the Tobe brothers. Evening, gents. What can I do for you? Uh, wait till I get rid of these games at this table, and then we can talk. Think Kelly will have anything lined up? Yeah, sure. He's got a lead on a couple of places. Okay, fellas. What's new? Well, that's what we want to know. What have you got lined up? Now, listen. Every weekend, the Boston store up the street here takes in about 20 grand, see? I stake the place, and I know how the watchman works, see? Oh, this place is a pipe. What's the lay? Oh, you go straight back to the back end, see? The safe is in the cashier's cage. Oh, it's a cinch, I tell you. How much did you say was in there? Between 15 and 20 grand. Is it a torch job? Oh, no, nah, you can knock it over with a can opener. Yeah, you better look it over, Harry. I'll go by there tomorrow morning. We better let you and Art and Louie handle this. I'll stake out and keep an eye on the coppers. Hey, uh, uh, what's the best time they take it, Kelly? Oh, about 9 o'clock Sunday morning. Hey, wait a minute. What are we going to do in the meantime? Well, I got a tip on another job that you might knock over tonight. Oh, why didn't you say so before? Come on, let's go. Where is this job? Right up Central Street here. 213 is the number. They do a lot of business and usually have a grand or so laying around in the safe. What kind of a safe? Fourth job? Yeah, you'll have to burn it, all right. When's the best time? Oh, about 3 o'clock. I happen to know the cop on that beat, and he's way up in the other block about that time. Okay, 3 o'clock makes it. Returning to the tourist camp where they had registered, Becker, Tobe, and Babajan prepared to open the turf cigar store safe at 3 o'clock the next morning. In the quiet of the early hours, broken only by the passing of an occasional automobile, Art Tobe, his brother Harry, Becker, and Louis Babajan drive to the address Kelly had given them. Here's the joint. Two more trees. All right, you wait. Keep the engine hot and be ready to scram. Okay, then get going. Go on, Louis. Bring that other tank. Oh, uh, once enough. Hey, let's go. Got that crowbar? Yeah. Okay, Louis, do your step. Ah, uh, this is a pipe. Just a little bad luck. A little heel like this. And this is off. Oh, again, my friend. Hey, where's that box? Over there in that corner. Hey, nice view for us from the street, too, huh? Yeah, and brought a blanket out of the car. Where'd that come from? From the cabin. It's got the uh, Dixie Construction Company painted on it. Hey, Harry, you should sure to wait for them. Nah, Jim Blake did. He used to live in that tourist camp. Maybe he left it there. Yeah, if he did, he still the better one. Come on, let's go to work. Hey, Louis, hold that blanket up so the torch flare won't be seen out front. Okay, give me a hand with this other end, will you? Yeah. Come on, stretch it out there. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> hey. This thing melts like cheese. How much you got left? Uh, less than a quarter of an inch. Check it up, will you? No, what's the matter? You losing your noise? No, I just don't want to spend the night in this joint. Come on, come on, you guys. Quit that argument. All right, all right. All right. The time either. There Do she more. is, my friend. Both doors open. Hmm? Help yourself, little children. Oh, boy. Look at them silver dollars, will you? That's <laughs> just like a mint. Put out that torch, you dope. Yeah. Come on, get that stuff together and let's get out of here. Here, Louis. Take the silver. Okay. I'll bring the it. tank. If I can take the rest of the stuff. Your set. Let's beat it. Sheriff's office. Sheriff Merrill speaking. Wait a minute. How much? 
One thousand silver dollars, that's meant 1935. Uh-huh. Yeah. Got any fingerprints? Four sets, huh? Good work. Looks like the Toe Brothers to me. What do you think? Yeah, I had a tip they were headed this way. Got it too late, though. Sheriff Merrill and his deputies gather all information possible at the scene of the crime. Interview other possible suspects. Talk to the manager of the auto court where the Toad boys, Becker and Barbagian, had stopped and broadcast this information to offices in Los Angeles and San Francisco, known hangouts for the gang. Soon, information from the Department of Justice, Washington, was being received in Phoenix. Referring fingerprint information, your prints mentioned show subjects as Louis Barbagian, Henry Becker, Arthur Tobe, and Harry Tobe. Nice bunch of boys. However, why this information to San Francisco and Los Angeles? What do you want to do? Round them up there or bring them all back here? Let's round them up in Los Angeles. Okay. Where you been, Art? Ain't seen you for several days. Ah, me and the boys have been on a little trip. Well, what happened to the Lincoln you was in last week? I see you're driving the old Ford. Oh, that? <laughs> well, now, that was part of the act. You see, we traded the Ford in on the Lincoln for the trip, and then we brought it back. <laughs> we said we didn't like it, and we got the other car back. Nice going. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Oh, I don't know. Rest up a few days, then go back and knock over another job. What do you mean, go back? Ah, we don't pull any jobs in Los Angeles. We do them in Arizona. And then come back here and blow the dough. Did you just pull a job? Sure, sure, down in Phoenix. Geez, you guys must be smart to pull all them jobs and beat the rap. Ah, we just don't slip up, that's all. It don't take no brains to fool cops. Don't it? Yeah, I never had no trouble beating cops in the thinking racket. Say, look, I know right now that the L.A. cops are after me hot and heavy, see? Am I hiding? Nah. Or they even got a guy tailing me all the time, see? Do I care? <laughs> nah. I'll give him the slip any time I get ready to blow. You mean it, Art? Your yeah, cops are dumb. You can fool them every time. Oh, uh, hey, oh, give us another bourbon, will you? All right, here you are. Hey, that's a nice new shiny dollar, ain't it? Yeah. Hey, let me see that. Huh. United States of America, 1935. Peace dollar. Huh. Yeah, I wonder where they made this one. Yes. What's that for, Art? Hmm? Oh, oh, that's a mint mark. That one was made in San Francisco. That's what the S is for. Well, ain't that something? <laughs> Boy, you're the dumbest guy I ever saw. Well, you're almost dumb enough to be a cop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I am at that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Burglary details. Joseph speaking. Hmm? Sure, we're ready. Send them in. Well, they're bringing in our young hoodlum. Edward, you better get over there on the right. Okay, Roach, you can sit there by Barber. I'll sit here and ask these monkeys a few questions. Come in. Come on in, boys. I believe you know these officers. This is Deputy Sheriff Roach and Detective Edwards of Phoenix. You ever been there? Oh, I believe you know Lieutenant Barber. At least you do, Art. This is Art Tobe and Henry Becker. That's what he was calling himself the last time I picked him up. How about it, Henry? Yeah, and that's to you, Copper. Nice boys, both of them, when you get to know them like we do. Now, boys, sit down and take it easy. We want to ask you a few questions. A bit personal, perhaps, but then you know how these things are. You like to talk, don't you, Copper? Well, listening's more in my line, Becker. Well, let's get on to business. Henry, I want to ask you some questions regarding a burglary that was committed in Phoenix, Arizona on February 7th, 1937. Get going. You purchased a Lincoln Zephyr from an automobile dealer at Adams and Figueroa. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And in company with Art Tobe, you drove that car to Phoenix, Arizona. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And in that car, you had a cutting torch and two Presto tanks, did you not? Yes. Yeah. Which were being taken to Phoenix for the purpose of opening a safe there. Is that true? So what? Do you know that opening a safe by the use of torches is considered an explosive case? Huh? I said that using a torch on a safe constitutes a felony. Or explosives are used. No, you can't pull that one on me. I didn't use no explosives. Did you know that the license number of your car was taken by the tourist camp manager in Phoenix? No, I, I didn't know that. 
Did you remove a blanket from the outer court where you and Art were staying? Oh, yeah. Where's the blanket now? I don't know. Hey, hey listen, Shilson. I don't know what you're asking me all these questions for. I, uh, well, I admit I went to Phoenix and the Lincoln, and I, I admit I took a longer cutting torch, but I'm a welder by trade, see, and I, well, I used that in a repair job down here. Hey, you can't pin that torch job on me. Did I say anything about a turf job? Well, no, but, no. What's the idea, Becker? Hiding something? I ain't talking. You ever see that dollar before, Becker? No. You ever see it, Ike? No. That's funny. Got your fingerprints all over it. Now, listen, you ain't got nothing on me. Art, didn't you tell me you pulled a job in Phoenix? I never saw you before in my life. Take a good look, Art. Don't you remember your stumble bum friend, Shorty? Why, you double-clock and rat I told you that guy wasn't on the level, but you was too smart to listen to anybody else, you screwball. Yeah, you're the pin you raised, Becker. Ah, shut up. Go ahead, Becker. Don't mind us. Next to you, copper. Thanks, Becker. Now tell me, what did you boys do with the money? Wouldn't you like to know, huh? We do know. We just want to get your version of it. Do you want to tell us now, or shall we wait till you get to Phoenix? Yeah, well, what the, what the was it to make any hard? Yeah. Yeah, we knocked over that torch joint. We we got about 1500 bucks, see? Some of it was in silver and some of it in paper. The blanket was left in the store. We had the Dixie Construction Company painted on it. I, uh, I don't know where it came from, but... Who else was in on this job, Becker? Wouldn't you like to know, huh? Well, we'll consider your suggestion, Henry, and find out. Okay, Bill, lock him up. Listen, Chilton, let's get Ray Bogey and Claxton and stake out that joint where they lived before. The patient's going to turn up there sooner or later. Sounds like a good idea. Four days, Officer Claxton and Bogey, deputies from the sheriff's office, working with Chilton and Barber, staked the house where the Tobe brothers, Becker and Barbagian, had been known to hang out. Then... One rainy night near the middle of February, a car drove up and stopped at the curb in front of the rooming house. Across the street, ready for instant action, sat Chilton and Barber in their car. Inside the house, Claxton and Bogey waited. After a chase in which the bandits fell off, Chilton and Barber go back to the house to confer with Claxton and Bogey. What happened after we left, Bogey? I came back twice. Oh, we got tied up in a traffic jam on third and couldn't get out. Uh, how come your birds couldn't catch them? Hey, do you ever try to catch Barney Oldfield? Ah, uh, you guys are afraid to drive that car. Let me get a chance of those monkeys. I'll knock them over. <laughs> That's your story. Look, look, Chilton. You stay here with Claxton. And Ray and I'll take the car and see what our race driver here can do with the Bajan and his mom. All right, wise guy. You're going to see some driving. There they are again. Let's go. See him anywhere? Yeah, he lost down the street. Oh, come on, you better step on. Well, just hold on, Carl. We're going after those babies. Are you coming, detective? See your hoods anywhere? Two blocks straight ahead. Look out for that corner left. He's going. Oh, what's the matter with that bird? Blind? Uh, lost your criminals, Mr. Bogey? Huh? Well, where? Yeah, you tell me. Well, I'll be. Well, can you beat that? I never saw two birds get away as easy as that since I've been a cop. Uh... Hey, there they go. On that side street. Hold on, Bower. Keep him in sight, Ray. I'm going to take a shot at that heap. <laughs> Got the gas tank. <laughs> well, let, let him have it again. Try a tire. <laughs> Miss. No. I thought you could drive this car. Well, I got it down to the floorboard now. What do you think this is, a Duesenberg? Hold it. I'm going to let him have it again. You hold. <laughs> nice going, my man. You got him. Ah, <laughs> watch that monkey slide. Nothing like a good flat tire and a wet street to make a car slide. Well, you better get that door open and be ready to slide the cuss on Ted Monkey when he gets that car stop. Yeah, don't worry about me. I'll take care of the driver and you get the other one. Okay, Monkey. Up with him. Hey, what's the idea? We ain't done nothing. Nah, I'm sure you haven't. We just wanted to talk to you a little. Oh, well, here's your other friend. What are you going to do with him? Drop him in the back seat there and let him see how he likes to ride in a police car. Police car? Say, listen, we didn't know you was coppers. We would have stopped. Honest, we would. We thought you was bandits or something. We thought maybe... Yeah, maybe we just wanted to give you a ticket for a speed. Yeah. How did you know? Button it up. Bring the guy on, Bob, and let's go. All right, fella. Climb in. Say, listen, you can't do this thing to me. Oh, is that so? Get in here. Uh, yes, sir.
Next morning, Babajian is brought into room 45 in the city hall for questioning in connection with the Phoenix burglary. With him is Harry Tobe, brought from San Francisco. The boys tell me you were in a hurry last night, Louie. Yeah. I was going to the bank for my old man. <laughs> I'll bet you were at that. What bank? Oh, any bank. Any bank robberies last night, Barber? Not by Babajian. Now, Louie, I want to ask you a few questions about that Phoenix job. Phoenix job? Oh, of course you wouldn't know about that, now would you? <laughs> I wouldn't know about anything you talk about. You weren't in Phoenix on the night of February 7th? February 7th? Let me think. Oh, no, no. February 7th, I was in Long Beach. Well, just so we won't waste your time, Louie, I think we ought to tell you that your friend, Art Toby, says that you were in Phoenix on the night of February 7th and that you and Harry here and Henry Becker broke into the turf cigar store and stole $1,500. That's a lie. You asked Harry where we were that night. Well, how about it, Harry? In Long Beach. <laughs> That's what I thought. Only I couldn't figure how you got that Dixie Construction Company blanket you left in your room. I couldn't figure how you got that in Long Beach. Oh, no, you don't. I left that blanket in the store. That's right. Huh? Huh? What? Yeah. We left it in the store in Long Beach. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In Long Beach. That's what I thought, too. Except I couldn't figure how those silver dollars got into your pocket, Louis. Why, uh, Harry gave me them silver dollars. Yeah, he got him in Frisco. Maybe he did, Louie, but he didn't give them to you because he was in jail in Frisco. Huh? Yeah, you know, jail, where you're going to be for so long. Yeah. Listen, Rap, stop trying to pin this on me. I'll give you lead poisoning. No, you won't, Harry. Not for a long time, you won't. Now let's stop beating around the bush. I want some facts. You, Louie, we understand you were going to knock over the Boston store in Phoenix. Where did you get your information on that place? I got it from K.O. Kelly. What did Kelly tell you? Well, he told me when the watchman wouldn't be there and how much we'd get. How much was that? Fifteen or twenty grand. How were you going to get into the place? <laughs> Easy. Bust is open. And who was to be in on the job? Harry Tobe. Ask myself. Watch yourself, Louis. Button it, Tobe, or I'll... You what? Oh, save it, boys. Save it. Now, Louis, uh, who was present when you got this information from Kelly? Art and Harry Tobe and myself. Harry, do you remember this conversation? I wasn't there. It was told to me afterwards by Louis and my brother. Say, maybe we ought to leave you boys alone for a while so you could get together on your story. That's my story. And I... you're stuck with it. Harry, uh, how was this safe going to be opened? With a hammer and punches. It was a safe that could be opened by the punch method? You could have opened it with a can opener. So you were there. I was in Long Beach. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. Well, how does it happen that you boys passed up this 20 grand in the Boston store? Well, Harry looked it over and found out the watchman stayed in the store all the time. I thought you said Kelly told you the watchman wouldn't be there. Yeah, but he lied to us. I... Well, it's uh, Art and Louie. Oh, of course. You were in Long Beach. That's what I said. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, look, boys, maybe we can get along better if I tell you some of the things we know about you. Now, uh, we know that you all live together in the apartment on Santee Street. You owned a Ford sedan. You traded it in for a Lincoln Zephyr, which you drove to Phoenix, Arizona. Right? So what? So you broke into the turf cigar store and got about $1,500, which you came back here to spend. How much of that did you get, Harry? About $165. Still in Long Beach? Not to you, copper. You know, Harry, I don't believe that Long Beach story. How about you, Roach? Well, no, I don't believe I do. Now, how about you, Edward? Well, I can't say, but I do. <laughs> well, Harry, it looks like you're going to have to go back to Phoenix. We're going to miss you, boys, I hope. So, the two Tobe brothers, Henry Kukieski, Elias Becker, and Louis Babajian, were prepared for transfer to Phoenix. Arrangements were made for them to see a few of their friends before leaving, and they were told they were to be transported by the mobile. A plan was formulated for their escape. Well, boys, we're about ready to go. Oh, Barbara, you got those leg irons? Yep, here they are. Hey, what's the idea of the Oregon boot? Yeah, what do you think we are, crooks? You can't do this thing to us. That's just what I thought. But you see, here's a pair for you, Louie, and a pair for you, Harry. I think you'll get used to them by the time you get to Phoenix. 
Well, so long, boys. And oh, yes, those tweezers your friend smuggled in uh, might work on handcuffs, but uh, not on those leg irons. So you can use them to pull your eyebrows. Goodbye, boys. Look, I still say you can't do this thing to us. Harry Tobe, Arthur Tobe, Henry Cookie Erske, and Louis Barbazian, criminals with long prison records, again stood before a judge to receive sentence. On March 15, 1937, less than two months after their crime, these men were sentenced to serve from four to ten years in the Arizona State Penitentiary. I'd like to warn you about this summer's driving and your oil. You know as well as I do that moving parts must be protected. And yet many oils you buy have not been de-waxed and de-jellied and will not stand the intense heat.